morning, everyone, and welcome to our uh, second Grand Rounds of the year. And I'm happy uh, it wouldn't be Grand Rounds if Carl Moody wasn't in the audience. And so, Carl, <laughs> you're old, old reliable. Here you are again. So, um, this morning, it's my privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Alan Bank. I think everyone knows Alan from his uh, illustrious career over at the United Hospital. Alan has probably knows more about the electrocardiogram than anyone in the in this room and also on the call, and so uh, we look to him for his work. He's he's done groundbreaking work in uh, studying the the ability of the electrocardiogram to guide resynchronization of of the heart for treatment of heart failure. He has um, distinguished himself with five patents and has drawn the interest of Medtronic with uh, a, a relationship to take his discoveries and uh, disseminate them to our patients worldwide, which he's working on now. And he gave us a grand rounds a few years ago that was excellent, and I'm sure today's will be equally. I'd like to thank our friends from Janssen Pharmaceutical, Denise and Lacey, for being out there with us this early Monday morning. So, Alan, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. and. Uh, I'd like to talk about electrical dyssynchrony and cardiac resynchronization therapy. Yeah, oh. All right, looks like we're good. Um, so uh, this is an outline of my talk today. I'm gonna first talk about, about the problems. What are the, what are the issues with uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy today? Next, the mechanism, how does it work? Can we uh, find enough data to explain the mechanism of action. Next, the measurement. How do we measure electrical uh, dyssynchrony? Uh, fourth, uh, graphics. How do we display what we've, what we've learned about electrical dyssynchrony so that people can see it, understand it, and act on it? Uh, next, outcomes. Uh, how do we find clinical and, and echocardiographic outcomes to show that uh, when we're uh, making changes in pacemaker settings, for example, that it's uh, resulting in positive effects on the patients. And finally, uh, the future. How, how do I envision this being used in the future? So it starts with the left bundle branch block. So the green wires are the uh, electrical system of the heart, and uh, the left bundle branch block carries electricity to the left ventricle, and it's a superhighway. The electrical impulses travel very fastly along the conduction fibers, and get out to the lateral posterior wall of the heart very fast so that the whole heart uh, can be uh, depolarized in uh, a very short time frame. Now, with the left bundle branch block, there's scarring, fibrosis, stretching, or some problem that delays the conduction through this superhighway, and the electricity has to go cell by cell by cell. So it starts here in the septum, and it's got to go slowly all the way around the apex and around to the lateral wall and posterior wall of the heart. So uh, that's the substrate that we're working with. What happens over time when the heart is out of sync, it starts uh, enlarging and uh, patients develop heart failure because the pump isn't working as an uh, effective uh, mechanism. So um, here's normal conduction. Uh, you can see that this is color-coded, so anything in red means that it's activated very early. This is a patient, narrow QRS. These are the LV and RV pressure uh, waveforms, and you see how they're synchronous. In a patient with a left bundle branch block, um, you get some areas activated early in the septum and others in the posterior lateral wall activated very late. Blue here, wide QRS, notching. And then you have uh, uh, the pressure waveform of the LV and the RV are uh, not overlapping, they're dyssynchronous. So here's what this looks like um, in a, a model of the heart. So you can see in a normal heart, uh, there's a synchronous contraction. Now compare that to the, the patient with the left bundle branch block. You can see that the heart uh, wobbles, there's uh, activity in uh, different parts of the heart at different time, and there's not a coordinated contraction. So to treat this, we put in a three wires, a right atrial lead, a right ventricular lead, and a left ventricular lead. And um, the idea is 
that uh, we get the timing of these leads to fire so that the heart is uh, contracting in a synchronous fashion and so that we're getting closer to the, the normal system where all the walls are activated at the same time. So a couple basic facts about CRT. Uh, it's been around for about 20 years with and without a defibrillator. It's indicated for patients with heart failure and ejection fraction less than 35% and some type of left ventricular conduction delay like a left bundle branch block. Um, Multicenter randomized trials in over 10,000 patients have been performed and they've shown pretty much improvements in any aspect you can think of of heart failure. Symptoms, quality of life, exercise capacity, left ventricular size, left ventricular systolic function, hospitalization rate, mortality. All those endpoints get, in, get improved in these multicenter studies. Um, there are about 160,000 implants per year in the United States and probably a similar number outside the United States. There's over 2 million patients with CRT devices worldwide, and the annual sales revenue of these devices is uh, 3.2 billion and rising. So this is a picture of the uh, first patient that we enrolled in a, a clinical trial, the companion CRT trial. This was in probably about 2002 or so, or 2003, somewhere in the early 2000s. And uh, he was, I think, the first patient to get a CRT device in, in this trial worldwide. And when I first saw him, he couldn't get out of bed barely. When he would eat, he would shift too much blood flow to his gut and he would get sick because he had very advanced heart failure. And after a month or two, he was out with a wheelbarrow uh, working in his backyard. And when you see a few patients like this, as uh, many of you have probably seen, you, you realize that in the right patient, this can be an amazing therapy. So what are the problems? Well, uh, there are two main areas of problems. The first is underutilization and the second is non-response or incomplete response to the therapy. So with respect to underutilization, there's over six million heart failure patients in the United States, and probably about 15 to 20% of those patients are potentially eligible for CRT. So here in this scenario, about 890,000 eligible patients and only about 139,000, and this was data from 2019, I think, um, only about uh, 139,000 uh, were treated on label and then another 22,000 were treated off label in the US. So we're not getting this to the people uh, that need it in near the numbers that it should be. Um, the second issue is non-response or incomplete response. So the normal trajectory for a heart failure patient is to, to gradually uh, progress downhill. And um, with this therapy, uh, we shift patients, so um, there's uh, about 5% of patients who actually do worse with this therapy when we put it in, about 15% who stay on this downward trajectory, and then the other 80% uh, or so either are called non-progressors, responders, or super responders. Um, so one of our goals is to basically take all these patients and ship, <clears throat> shift them upward, turn non-progressors into responders or super responders and so forth. So another way of looking at it is there's, there's kind of three broad areas that we can attack to try and solve this problem. One is we can improve patient selection for this so we get the right patients uh, to the device. The second is uh, uh, device optimization, so getting them programmed correctly. And the third is lead location. The lead needs to be in the right spot in order to deliver the therapy. All right, let's talk about the mechanism. So here's where our leads are on a, a cross section of the heart. Here's the uh, LV lead in the posterior lateral wall. Here's the LV, the RV, which is more anterior, the LV, which is more posteriorly located in the chest. And here's the RV lead. Now, um, what I'm gonna try and convince you of is that CRT works via, predominantly via this mechanism, that's wavefront fusion. That is, there's three electrical wavefronts and you want to get those three wavefronts to all come and meet in the middle of the left ventricle. <clears throat> and I'm going to show you a lot of data that I hope will convince you that this is, this is the mechanism of how CRT works. So, um, so there's a native wavefront, which is coming down from the atrium down to the septum and then moving towards the posterolateral LV. That's in red. 
There's the RV lead, wavefront generated from the RV lead, which is also sitting in the septum and moving posterolaterally. And then there's the LV lead, which is sitting here and moving away from in the opposite direction. So if we look at it on an EKG, patient that has a left bundle branch block will have um, Q waves, deep Q waves, high voltage in V1, V2, V3. If you look at a patient who's pacing from the RV, so again, it's a wavefront coming from the septum, moving posteriorly, it looks similar here, V1, V2, V3. In a patient with a right bundle branch block, uh, the activity's all moving in the opposite direction because the Purkinje fibers are carrying the activity to the lateral LV and it's moving everything towards the septum, so you get these tall R waves in V1, V2. And then with CRT, you get a, a, a combination of a left bundle branch block and a right bundle branch block. You get this intermediate um, electrogram where the voltage is lower and the uh, activity is not, not a deep Q wave, not a tall R wave, but something in between. So Mike Sweeney from um, Mass General in, uh, in Boston um, did some work and, and looked at wavefront fusion and electrocardiographic cancelization. And what he described was if you have an RV paced wavefront that's moving away from the septum, the anterior wall of the chest, and moving towards the posterior wall, then you have an LV paced wavefront that's moving in the opposite direction. If these two meet appropriately in the middle, then you get a cancellation of electrical activity. So the, uh, let's say, lead V1 that's sitting on your chest and looking at the electrical activity, it sees one, one wavefront moving away from it, one moving toward it, and it can't tell the difference. So they cancel, the, they cancel each other, and you get uh, a much lower amplitude electrogram. So in reality, if these are timed absolutely perfectly, you'd see almost a flat line because they're completely canceling each other. So he calls this destructive interference or electrocardiographic cancelization. So can we use this to try and figure out how to, how to understand CRT and how to program CRT devices? So we started with uh, just 12 lead electrograms. Now this is a patient who, 73-year-old um, male uh, with left bundle branch block, a wide QRS, 170 milliseconds. And we just uh, turned off the RV lead, so we're pacing only from the left ventricle lead. And we're fusing the left ventricular wavefront <coughs> with the native wavefront. And we did this because it's much easier to understand if you have two wavefronts fusing than if you have all three, because then it gets much more complicated. So we're gonna look at LV only pacing, and we're gonna see what happens. So you can see that if we have a long AV delay, AV delay is the timing between when the atrium either senses or paces, and when the ventricle lead fires. So if we have a long AV delay, it looks kinda like a left bundle branch block. You see a deep Q wave here. And as we shorten the AV delay, so meaning we're firing the LV lead earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier, what happens is <clears throat> the amplitude gets shorter and smaller and smaller till it gets isoelectric. And then it flips. And then it starts getting uh, bigger but upright. See the same thing in V1 and V2 here? And again, V1 and V2 are kind of parallel to the to these wavefronts, so they're the easiest ones to, to see this, but you see it in other leads too, depending on the patient's heart uh, location in the chest and, and where the leads are. But anyway, the, the point is that you can see electrocardiographic cancelization here. As you get uh, a better timing of the wavefronts, the electrogram amplitude gets smaller and you get a, a, an intermediate form where there's low amplitude and, and relatively isoelectric. Now this also happens when you adjust uh, VV timing, so the timing between the LV, when the LV lead fires and the RV lead fires. So in this case, we, um, we program the patient so that the RV and LV lead fire at a very short AV delay. So if they're firing very early, then the native wavefront doesn't have time to come through. So now we're looking at fusion between the RV paced wavefront and the LV paced wavefront, and we see the same thing. at um, when the RV lead is 20 milliseconds ahead, RV lead is firing 20 milliseconds ahead of the LV lead, it looks kind of like a left bundle branch block again. 
And then as we start progressively firing the LV lead earlier, 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 we get this relatively narrow isoelectric waveform. So the same thing happens there. Now, if we look at just lead V1, just to make it simple, and we say, what happens to this lead V1 if we pace from LV only, so we've turned off the RV lead, we have an LV wavefront and we have a native wavefront, and we want to fuse those. But what happens to it? Here we're pacing it very early at 100 milliseconds in this patient who has a long PR interval. And you can see what happens. Every 20 milliseconds, it keeps getting smaller, 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 and then flips till it's almost the same as the native wavefront. So this is V1 going away from the septum. So, um, so that's, that's what's happening. And you can see how, how consistent uh, this is. It happens like this pretty much all the time. Uh, so we said if that's what's happening, then maybe we can recreate this um, mathematically. So we took a patient and we measured the, uh, the electrogram in V1 right here, pacing from the LV lead only. And this is what it looks like. Then we took the, uh, the native wavefront, native electrogram, which is down here. And then we just progressively move these closer and closer together till they around here, they overlapped completely. So um, basically, this is just adjusting the timing between the LV wavefront and the native uh, patient's native wavefront. And so here's how we did it theoretically with the, with the data we collected. And here's what we actually found when we measured it. So the uh, blue is the actual electrogram for V1 at all these different AV delays, and the pink is what actually happened when we uh, mathematically summated these two wavefronts. So what this is showing is that if you just take two wavefronts and you, it, uh, that you measure in humans and you move them closer and closer and closer together till you get the timing right, till they're perfectly overlapping, then we could recreate almost exactly what we, what we measured in patients. So to me, this is, this is uh, hard to dispute that um, that, that this is the mechanism of action of how CRT is working. It's fusing these two wavefronts so we can recreate it. Um, okay. So how do we measure this? Well, you know, the, traditionally we measure electrical dysynchrony by QRS duration. That's what we have. How wide is the QRS? So we know if it's wide, it's taking a long time for the electricity to get all the way uh, to all areas of the left ventricle. But there's a problem with this, and um, you know, how do we measure it? Do we do a, a single lead? If so, which lead? Do we do a single beat, or do we average multiple beats? Do we average all the leads, or do we just use the longest QRS? What defines the start and the end of the QRS? It's oftentimes not very clear. There's kind of a slurring. Um, do we do this by calipers? Do we do it automated? Do we do it at a fast paper speed, a, slow, a normal paper speed? And how reproducible is it, both within an individual and across individuals? And studies have shown it's not very reproducible. And also, these changes are pretty subtle. So something might go from, you know, when we're programming somebody, maybe the QRS ratio will go from 140 milliseconds to 137 milliseconds. And, you know, how do you pick that up, actually? It's very hard. So, you know, Lord Kelvin, a famous British scientist, said, to measure is to know. If you can't measure something, you can't improve it. So you need to have a good measure of, of electrical dyssynchrony. And QRS duration, while it's, you know, it's okay qualitatively, it's very tough quantitatively to, to use. So we said, let's try, let's try another uh, methodology to see if we can understand using this wavefront fusion and cancellation, electrocardiographic cancelization. So what we do is we bring two uh, EKG machines, two regular EKG machines into a patient's room put nine leads on the chest. This is V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and we added three more leads. And then we take a second machine and put nine leads on the back. And then we, uh, we have these two electrograms, and then we, uh, in our computer, we take the data and put a single beat all together. So this is uh, 18 electrograms of one beat. And here's what it looks like if we do different AV delays. So again, really short. Oh, let's start over here, a very long AV delay. 
The blue are the leads that are in the, on the anterior the front of the chest. The green are the ones in the back. And so what you can see is it looks like uh, what I've been showing you with the left bundle branch block, big Q waves here. And then what happens as we shorten AV delay, amplitude gets smaller, 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 and the blue ones flip, and the green ones also, they're upright because the electrical activity in a left bundle branch block is moving towards the posterior wall, and then they also flip. So over here, you've got a complete reversal of what you have over here. So we said, well, how do we, you know, that's what it looks like. So there's a pattern, and we see this pattern pretty much every time. So how do we take that pattern and then quantitate it? Um, so what we decided to do was to figure out a way of, of figuring out the space between all the curves. Because what's happening when you look at the pattern is that these curves are getting crunched, squished, and flipped. They're getting crunched on the x-axis, they're getting squished on the y-axis, and then they're flipping. So can we figure out a way to quantitate that? So here's, uh, here's my uh, electrograms, 18 electrodes. The area w uh, between all these curves, so we wrote a um, computer program that would take multiple pairs of these curves and determine the space between them. So this is kind of the combined space between all these curves. It was minus 13, meaning it was more space below the line than above it, minus 13 millivolts times milliseconds. And if you look in a left bundle branch block patient, this patient was negative 166 because everything in this patient was moving away from the septum towards the posterior wall. And then as we shorten the AV delay, this space goes down. It goes to 99, 68, 35, 3, and then it becomes positive. And so what's happening, we think, um, is that in a left bundle branch block, everything is going towards the posterior lateral wall. And then once we start kicking in the LV lead and bringing it earlier and earlier, these wavefronts start to fuse until they meet right in the middle, and then they start meeting too close to the, to the septal wall. And um, so this is called, we call this the area under the curve. And then we call this cardiac resynchronization index as a percent change in area under the curve. So it's just a, um, you know, what, so for example, here, it's three, it's changed, um, so we take 166 minus three is 163, and divide it by 166, so basically there's a 90, 95, 98% improvement in the area under the curve. And this is what it looks like on a bar graph. And in the, uh, the dark shaded bars are when the wavefront is predominantly moving towards the posterior wall, and the light shaded bars are when it's moving predominantly towards the septum. Or in other words, when the fusion point is to the left of center or to the right of center. So this is an, an incredibly reproducible measurement. If you look here, this is a Bland-Altman assessment, and basically if you measure the thing uh, at the beginning of a study and then at the end later, you get the pretty much the same answer, and here's a, here's a correlation. Uh, slope of one and almost perfectly on the line. And that's what you expect because electrograms are so reproducible that they're a great thing to use. When we try and do stuff like this with echo or some other measurement, it's impossible because things vary so much, the angle, the ability to measure stuff. But when you put an electrogram, it sits there and measures the exact same thing every time. So here's what it looks like in, in a patient. Um, uh, where we can measure um, the uh, CRI, this cardiac resynchronization index, which is a percent improvement in their uh, dyssynchrony um, during bi-V pacing in the blue. So this is the RV lead, LV lead, and the native wavefront. And this is during LV only pacing in the red. Um, and we can generate these uh, curves. So we did a study, we published this a couple years ago, and we said, let's look at, we looked at about, I think, 80 or 90 patients. And we said, um, you know, how, if we assess different settings, can we figure out um, what the best setting is that has the best CRI, the best improvement in synchrony? And what we found is that if you program a patient in a standard setting, just kind of throw the device in and put it on a typical setting where you fire the RV and LV leads at the same time, um, there's about a 50% improvement in electrical dyssynchrony. 
So this is kind of all the large studies that have been done with CRT. They're getting about a 50% on average improvement in electrical dyssynchrony. If we optimize patients, we can get them to 92%, and we probably get them to even higher than that um, because we're only going in 20 millisecond steps. If we did finer steps, we'd probably get higher. But anyway, we can get them to 90 to 100%. Um, what we found is oftentimes patients needed the LV lead firing ahead of the RV lead because the LV lead is not sitting in, uh, it's sitting in a vein, it's not screwed into the myocardium. There's probably scar, there's latency, there's um, you know, a time delay of getting the electrical activity into the myocardium. And so uh, oftentimes patients will need 20, 40, or 60 milliseconds of LV preactivation, but it's different in every patient, so you have to measure it. Okay. So how do we, dis how do we display this and how do we figure out how to, um, how to cover all the possible settings? When you look at CRT programming, there's actually thousands of options. Why is it? Well, you can adjust the AV delay, the timing between the atrium and the ventricular firing. But you can also adjust the VV delay. When do the two uh, ventricular leads fire? You can sense from the atrium, or you can increase the rate on the atrial pacing, and you can pace from the atrium. And then you can pr program a patient by V, where the RV and LV leads are both firing, or LV only, where you turn off the RV lead, and you just fire the LV lead. And then you've got to, to make everything more complicated, you've got quadrupolar electrodes. So your LV electrode has a, a tip, and then it has these uh, electrodes at three other locations, mid and, and basal. So how do you know which one to fire from uh, in order to get the best synchrony? Well, right now what happens is we try a couple different electrodes, and we say, well, which one has the lowest threshold, which is going to give us the longest battery life? Which one's not going to cause phrenic nerve stimulation or a side effect? But we don't program based on efficacy, like which one's going to get the patient the most better. <clears throat> so we said, well, how, how do we, how do we, you know, we can't measure a thousand different settings. How do we do that? So, um, so again, just to to show you how this these uh, the, the timing is described. So you can atrial sense or atrial pace. If you have 140 milliseconds programmed to when the RV lead fires and 140 milliseconds to when the LV lead fires, that'd be called VV0 because these are both firing simultaneously. If you fire the LV1 at 100 milliseconds and the RV1 at 140, then this would be VV minus 40, the LV leads 40 milliseconds ahead. So we said, let's try generating a, uh, a grid. So we did an eight by eight grid in this patient where the <clears throat> timing between the atrium and the RV lead firing is 140, <clears throat> 160, 180, 200, all the way up to 280. The patient's PR interval was, was 280 at a long PR interval. He was pacing from the atrium. And then we did the same thing, timing the HALV interval. So basically within here, we have all different combinations of AV delays and all different combinations of VV delays. Um, and so we, we measured it, we put our, um, you know, electrograms, our 18 electrograms in here, and then we calculated the CRI and uh, then color-coded it. So this is what we get. So we get this um, mountain plot uh, that shows us uh, electrical synchrony. And right through the middle of this red area is optimal electrical synchrony. And that means that it's a combination of the a RV interval and the ALV interval that gives us the best synchrony. Or essentially, what's the best combination of AV delay and VV delay that gives us the best synchrony? Anything in red is 80% resynchronized or better. Anything in blue is like 20% or less resynchronized. So if we put this on a, um, on a flat map, it's, it's easier to see. So here's what it looks like. This is a, a different patient, but the same idea. So this line here is the VV0 line. In other words, the, um, the uh, ARV interval is 80, ALV interval is 80, 100, 100, 120, 120. So this is VV0 because the RV and LV later are firing at the exact same time. So you can see in this patient, no matter what AV delay you chose, if you chose an AV delay of 100, at VV0, you'd be right here. If you chose 140, 
at VV0, you'd be here. You could see that no matter what setting you program the patient at, you can't make them optimally synchronous. So that's why just adjusting the AV delay, which most of the trials have done where they study adjusting the AV delay, well, in most patients, you can't get them synchronous. And the reason is because you have two wavefronts coming from the septum. You have the native wavefront and the RV-paced wavefront, and you have one, the LV-paced wavefront, coming from the other side. And what happens is you have to give the LV-paced wavefront in most patients a head start. If you don't give it a head start, you're never going to get them synchronous in the 90 to 95% of patients, and because most of them look like this. So, um, so now let's talk about this optimal synchrony line, which runs right through here. So if you program the patient anywhere along this, along this line, you'll get them pretty darn synchronous, probably 90% synchronous or better. Now, if you look at it, this early part of the line is perfectly parallel to the VV0 line. Then it starts to curve, and then it becomes vertical at the top. So what's happening here? Well, what's happening here is fusion of different wavefronts. At a short AV delay here, this is shifted to the left because you're fusing the RV paste and LV paste wavefront. There's no native wavefront. There's nothing coming down from, from the atrium that's, at, that's depolarizing the heart because it's already been depolarized. The RV, RV paste. LV paste wavefronts have already fired, they've depolarized the heart, and then the native comes down, there's nothing left to do. So that's what's happening in a short AV delay. And intermediate AV delay, you're getting triple wavefront fusion. All three of those wavefronts are coming in. And up here, you have a very long, the RV lead is fire, coming in very, very late. And because it's coming in late, the ventricle's already depolarized. It's not doing anything. So this is essentially LV only pacing up across here. So here at the top, you have fusion of the LV wavefront and the native wavefront. So by looking at this graph, we can understand the, the physiology of what's going on. Short AV delay, the RV and LV paced wavefronts are fusing. Intermediate AV delay, all three of them are fusing. Long AV delay, the native, the native is fusing with the LV paced wavefront. And um, if you think that this is just, you know, I just picked a, you know, a really good example, um, then um, here's, you know, over 20 different patients. And we've, we've done probably 150 or more patients now with this. And they all look like this. Anytime a patient has a native wavefront, in other words, they're not in AFib and they don't have complete heart block. So anybody who has a native wavefront coming down, it always looks like a hockey stick. Every time. 100 out of 100. So it's telling you that's the physiology of what's happening. And you can see that it's always... Uh, parallel to the VV0 line at a short AV delay. It always curves up and always gets vertical at the top. So that's the physiology of what's happening. Now here's complete heart block. Notice that this is completely different. In complete heart block, there's no native wavefront um, because you can't, you're not getting any activity down from the atrium to the ventricle. So the lines are always shifted parallel and almost always to the left. So here's uh, 12 patients, but all of them look like this. It's a perfectly 45-degree uh, diagonal line right through the middle there. Okay, how about quadrupolar leads? How do we figure out which lead to pace from? So when I showed you those maps, it was from pacing from one of the electrodes. So we would pick an electrode, usually the one they came in with, assuming it was working okay, and we'd generate a map. But we can also generate a map pacing from a different electrode. So here's a patient where we paced from LV2. Um, so one of the middle electrodes in LV1, which is the, uh, the distal, the tip. And so you can see that these uh, maps have exactly the same shape. The only difference is that this one is shifted 20 milliseconds over to the left because the LV paced wavefront from LV1 is 20 milliseconds further away or you know, a scar or something. There's something that's delaying that wavefront by 20 milliseconds. But the, the native and the RV wavefronts are exactly the same. So they're going to give you the exact same shape of the curve. It's just going to be shifted over to the left. So we can do this and say, well, which, you know, we can choose which, uh, which vector to pace from, which of the LV electrodes we want to pace from, um, because this one is, is probably geometrically in not as good a position. It's taken longer for them to fuse. Um, here's another example. This patient needed 30 milliseconds 
of LV preactivation if you pace from LV4. But if you pace from LV1, they need 80 milliseconds. It's shifted way over here. So we would choose this one. It's going to be a better, it's going to be situated better anatomically and electrically. Now, how about, um, how about atrial sensing versus atrial pacing? How do you know whether to let the patient's, you know, natural atrial activity occur, or do you want to overdrive pace them, pace them faster from the, at from the atrium? Well, what happens here is when you pace from the atrium, there's a delay in the conduction to the AV node. We know that the a if we do a, an EKG, the PR interval is going to be longer when we pace as compared to when we sense from the atrium. So what happens, here's our map with atrial sensing, here's our map with atrial pacing. What you see is there's the same shift to the left, 30 milliseconds. It starts to curve up, but it starts to curve up later because the native wavefront is coming in later. And so, um, so you get the same curve, it's just that it kicks in later because the native wavefront has taken longer to get in. Now what's, what's interesting is if you get the right, um, if you get the timing right, the electrograms are, are identical. Here's um, pacing LV only with an AV delay of 60, sensing, this is sensing from the atrium, and here's pacing from the atrium, but at 100. So what this tells us is that there's a 40 millisecond delay when you pace as compared to when you sense. And once you factor in that 40 millisecond delay, these are identical. Every one of these is identical. So it's telling you it's the exact same electrical wavefront that's coming through. It's just when you pace, it's taking a little longer to get there. How about narrow QRS? You know, we're taught that, you know, we don't, don't put CRT in narrow QRS patients. The multicenter studies have shown that it's not beneficial. Some people say it harms them. Well, I, I don't think that's correct. I think if you find the right patients that have a narrow QRS but still have a left ventricular activation delay, so let's say they have an incomplete left bundle, or let's say they have a left bundle of 120 milliseconds, electrically you can make them better. We have to prove that we can make them clinically better, which is another story. But um, So here's a patient, had a QRS of 110 milliseconds. You look at this EKG, this is not a wide QRS. But you notice he still has a left ventricular activation delay because he still has like these deep Q waves, they're just not that wide. V1 and V2. So there's some delay in his electrical activity getting to the left side of his heart, but it's just a, a much milder form of electrical dyssynchrony. So here's after a CRT device was put in, and this patient was, this was done over 10 years ago when we were, you know, studying what happens in narrow QRS patients. Um, and uh, you can see this electrogram is not much different than, than this one. Well, here's how he was programmed. He was programmed in AV delay of 130. He didn't kick his LV lead in nearly early enough. They were off by 50 milliseconds. So once we programmed him to an AV delay of 80, we got him 100% resynchronized, either with BIV pacing or with LV only pacing, either one in his case. And uh, this guy was a, a kind of a North Woodsman from, uh, from northern Minnesota. And uh, I saw him back in clinic. He said, yeah, within like a few days or a week of when you made this change, I was out back hunting deer and putting them over my shoulder and carrying them. You know, I mean, it made a huge difference in him. You looked at his echo, it was very subtle. It was hard to tell a lot of difference, but clinically it was, it was obvious. Um, <clears throat> so why might narrow QRS patients have not done so well in the studies? Well, uh, we think we have a partial answer, and that is that this resynchronization window is much narrower. If you look at how wide this red area is in a patient with a left bundle QRS of 160, compared to this patient with a QRS of 116, but a left bundle branch block like pattern on EKG, this is about half as wide as this. And again, if you program somebody within this red area, they're gonna be 80% synchronized or better. Well, the reason is because if their conduction system isn't as diseased, you gotta get the timing just perfect, because if you think about it, you two wave fronts, if they're moving fast, you gotta get the timing perfect for them to meet in the middle. If they're moving slow, you could be off by a little bit, no big deal, they're still gonna meet in the middle. So this window of resynchronization is much narrower, probably half the size in a narrow QRS patient. So all those studies that were done, they didn't know how to optimize patients, they had no idea, they just threw the device in and put it at the standard settings. Um, but if you, if you can have a way of measuring it now, 
you could take patients who aren't as electrically sick and potentially still make them better. So this was 99 patients that we looked at, and we looked at this, uh, these Gaussian curves are basically the, um, you know, the, the LV only pacing across here. So it's basically telling us, you know, low gets higher, 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 best, and then lower. So we could generate these curves, and we took narrow QRS, intermediate, so moderate QRS was one, so narrow was less than one, 130 or 120, I think less than 130, and this one is 130 to 150, and this was greater than 150 milliseconds. And you can see that the shape of these um, curves is very different. So essentially the space in between here is, is the window you have for programming. So you can see how much wider the window is as the QRS gets larger. So how about selection of patients for QRC, for uh, CRT? Can we use this to figure out who's going to be the best candidate for CRT? Well, right now we look at QRS duration. But we think this is a more sensitive measure, this area under the curve. So we looked at uh, left bundle branch block patients that have the so-called Strauss morphology. These are ones that have wide QRS notching and kind of all the standard characteristics of the left bundle. And then we looked at RV paste patients. And this is how much dyssynchrony they have using this area under the curve. And then we use a different criteria for left bundle branch block, European Society cardiology. And then we use IVCD patients and right bundle branch block. So we think that we can measure electrical synchrony, dyssynchrony to a much better degree uh, using this as opposed to just uh, QRS duration. And here's what happens. If you program all these different groups of patients to a standard setting, you know, they all, their area under the curve goes down to about 40, 50, or, or 60, or somewhere around there. But then if you get them optimized, you can get them down to almost a zero area under the curve. And here, um, here's a patient with a wide QRS, 150 milliseconds. Here's a patient with narrow, 120. See how much narrower it is here than here. But they still have the same, same electrical dyssynchrony mapping. It's the same, the same shape, it's just narrower. So how about LV lead location? One of the problems is patients get these leads in and then we don't know, well, is the lead in a good spot or not? Do we need to revise it? Can we just fix them by programming things? Um, do we need to move on to something else like transplant or LVAD or some other aggressive therapy if they're not responding? Well, we could do these maps and in patients that have a lead in a bad spot, uh, we can see it on the maps. In this patient, they had 80 milliseconds of LV latency. Here's the pacing spike. And it's not till 80 milliseconds later that the ventricle actually gets depolarized. So there's some problem with getting the electricity from the electrode to the heart. And uh, so what happens is this is shifted way over to the left. Here's a patient who had a lead that was too far anterior. So what happens when it's anterior? Well, these wavefronts aren't opposing each other. If they're both coming from the same spot, they're going to never cancel each other. So you get this, you, don't get, you get no red area. All you get is yellow here, and you can't get this patient resynchronized because their lead's in a bad spot. Here's a patient whose lead was way anterior. So here's the front of the chest on a lateral chest x-ray. Here's his lead. Here's the new lead. This is his patient's map um, when his lead was anterior. You could not get him resynchronized. You're essentially generating two wavefronts from the same location. Here's the patient when we moved it posteriorly. We get this beautiful map. Now here's the last patient. Here's a lead that's too far apical. You can't pace from the ap uh, People in literature have done studies and they looked at apical versus non-apical and they debate about what apical lead is horrible. It doesn't help any because think about it. Here's where your RV lead is in the RV apex. Here's the LV lead. This is a CT scan that looking at the underneath side of the heart kind of rotated. Here's the LV lead. It's out at the apex. Now how are you going to generate opposing wavefronts when they're sitting right next to each other. You need to have the LV lead to mid or preferably basal posterior lateral lead uh, so that you can have opposing wavefronts. And here's the guy's map. So how about outcomes? Well, I've shown you a lot about electrical dyssynchrony. How about mechanical dyssynchrony? Because the electrical has to, con has to translate into mechanical dyssynchrony, and then mechanical dyssynchrony has to translate into changes in heart function heart size, and um, patient clinical, you know, function. So this was a study in animals, and uh, Strick, who works with uh, Fritz Prinzen in the Netherlands, did this beautiful study 
where they generated, generated maps just like ours, and this is where we actually got our idea to generate the maps we did. We said, they can do it in dogs, we can figure out how to do it in humans. And in th these dogs, they had, you know, like a 100 plus electrode vest around the dog's heart. They had catheters in the RV and LV. They had ultrasound crystals on the heart. You know, they had everything rigged up in these hearts. And they, they could then generate maps of electrical resynchronization. But what was cool is that they showed that this translates almost exactly to mechanical dyssynchrony. And then it also translates to change in LVDPDT. So we're going from electrical to mechanical to hemodynamics here. This patient's with LBB, this patient with heart block. And um, if you look at these maps, which are similar to the ones I showed you, again, they get this hockey stick shape. And uh, here they go from electrical to stroke work that they measured. And here's LVDPDT, so the change in pressure in the left ventricle. So if you improve the electrical synchrony, this is pretty strong evidence that you're going to improve the mechanical synchrony. And we see this on echo too. I'll show you. And then if you do that, you're going to improve LV function and remodeling. So, you know, when we try and time these patients and optimize them, it's like timing the spark plugs on a car, um, except it's easier for us because the timing in a car is actually has to be much more um, perfect than, than in the heart. When they advance this uh, crankshaft by four degrees, you start the ignition less than one millisecond sooner, 0.74 milliseconds sooner. So, so they're working on like, you know, getting something to within one millisecond or less to get the timing of a car engine to work right. For us, if we get within 10 or 20 milliseconds, we do pretty damn good and the patients do pretty damn good. So, you know, they have to be like 10 times as, as, as tight in their programming of car engines. So what about clinically? What, what can you do to identify patients that need optimization? <clears throat> well, I'm gonna show you four EKGs here. So here's a patient. Um, well, let me say, first of all, you wanna identify either electrical dyssynchrony or mechanical dyssynchrony or both. You figure out electrical dyssynchrony by looking at the electrogram, mechanical dyssynchrony by looking at the, EK, the echo, not the report, looking at the echo. If you look at the report, you're not gonna figure it out. You have to actually look at that echo and say, is it look to my eyes dyssynchronous or not? And, um, and so for the echo, you can look at this patient. See, he's got, still got deep Q waves here across the precordium. Most of the activity is moving away from V1 and, v and V2. Um, look at this patient. So its QRS is too wide. Again, you have these deep Q waves here. This patient, again, Q waves, a small R wave here, which is good, but the rest of it doesn't look good. And then look at this patient who's, who's resynchronized, really well resynchronized. Low amplitude, narrow QRS, isoelectric here in most leads. So if you see this, you don't have to worry. Your patient's going to be fine. Now, their EF may not have improved to normal, but that's maybe because they have a huge scar, they've had a big infarct or, you know, other things. But electrically, you've done what you could. If you see one of these things and one of two things is going on, they're either not programmed right or their leads in, in a bad spot um, in almost all cases. So, you know, look at everybody's EKG post CRT. I mean, 15 years ago, I never looked at EKG. I was just taught, you know what, it's paste. You know, what the hell, it's paste. What am I gonna see? You know, but there's an incredible amount of information there. So order EKGs and look at them in your patients post CRT. See if the QRS is really wide. Is the amplitude really high? Are there deep Q waves? And then you can kind of look at the, kind of imagine a butterfly plot of these six electrodes and say, is it mostly negative or mostly positive or whatever? And then on your echo, look for mechanical dyssynchrony. Is there uh, septum or anteroseptum or inferior wall dyssynchronous? Is there the shutter? Do you see the septum doing this or the anteroseptum on echo? Is there apical rocking? So you see the apex moving or hula hooping like that. Those are all markers of dyssynchrony. So I'll show you a couple examples. Here's a patient that was programmed here. They needed to be programmed over here. And here's, here's their echo, or their EKG. It looked a lot of deep Q waves. Here's once we got them synchronous. And here's, here's what happened to their echo. So look at, look at you know, you talk about apical rocking and uh, just kind of hula hooping where the heart's just kind of jostling around. And then here's after we get the patient synchronous. And you see that all the walls are coming in together. 
Here's another patient. They were off here. They should be over here. And uh, here's their echo. So EF is very low. You see that the apex is kind of rocking. The walls aren't coming in together. And here they are after we get them synchronized. You know, EF went from, you know, like 20% to probably 45, 50%. And here's a patient that was referred to us. Uh, Peter Ekman referred this patient to me because he was referred by Mayo to Peter because they want a second opinion on transplant. He didn't want a transplant. And you look at his EKG, he's got, it looks like a left bundle branch block. His lead was way anterior. So Dr. Vaderat put in a new lead and put it way back here. And here's what his echo showed. So we look at him here, EF about 15, 20% just sits there and rocks. Here's after we got the new lead put in, but we didn't have them synch synchronous, we didn't have his timing right. And you see how it wobbles and the walls are not all coming in together. And here's once we got them synchronous. Now, um, I'll say a, a word about left bundle branch area pacing because this is a, a new technology <coughs> where we're uh, actually putting an LV lead in the high septum and trying to drill it through the wall of the LV and, and activate the left bundle distal to the, to the His bundle. And this is a, a, a very good therapy, but you also need to program the patients correctly. So this patient was programmed here. This is a different kind of map and I won't go into it, but basically their AV delay was too long. And when we shorten the AV delay to get the right AV delay so that the, the native wasn't screwing things up and and we were able to paste the uh, left bundle branch. Um, here's what it looked like. So here's the patient before. Again, you see the apical rocking and dyssynchrony. Here's the patient post-CRT. They didn't get any better. So why was this? Well, you know, the EP doc got the lead in a good spot. It's just that it didn't have them programmed right. And so when we got them programmed right, then the LV function is much better. So we have retrospective data that this all works. This is a study we published in 2018. We looked at 130 patients with CRT. Prior to 2013, we weren't optimizing patients. We just left them at their standard settings. After 2014, we started looking at their 12 lead ECG and trying to figure out how to optimize them. So we broke, we looked at these two different groups and we broke patients into, based on their MRI scan on uh, idiopathic cardiomyopathy, no ischemia, no infarct, and then um, patients with scar, so they have an infarct here, subendocardial scar. And this is a patient that had midwall fibrosis, this white area here. And uh, the red is uh, before we started optimizing, blue is after we started optimizing. If you had no scar and you had an idiopathic cardiomyopathy, you did well. Either way, these were similar. But if you had this fibrosis in your septum, you didn't improve very well at standard settings. But if we optimized you, you went from an improvement in EF of two units to 12. If you had a scar, you didn't do very well at all. If you had a big infarct, oh, we could get you to um, improvement in six units by optimizing you. This was retrospective data. So now we're, we have uh, three studies ongoing to prospectively study this. So one of them where we take uh, pretty much any patient with a CRT, but in particular non-responders, we put our map on them, we program them to the best setting, we get another echo in six months, and we're going to look at uh, non-randomized, but look at how they, how they do and where their optimization makes a difference. And we've seen pretty big improvements so far in a lot of them. This is a, a multi-lead EKG to effectively optimize resynchronization, Meteor CRT. This is a randomized trial. So a patient has a new implant. They get um, the map put on them. They get programmed to either a standard setting or the best setting for six months. We get another echo at six months. Then everybody gets programmed to the best setting, and they get another echo six months later. So we put in 25 patients so far, and we want to do this. We're doing this here, here uh, at um, Abbott and at United, and we want to get about four or five more sites and uh, do this as a multi-center study. Um, and we're submitting a proposal to Medtronic to fund this. Um, and then we're just starting a study that I'm, I've been working with Dr. Cavalcanti on uh, cardiac MR and non-responders. Now that we can do MRI scans and um, in CRT patients and still get good data without problems and interference from the device and, and device compatible um, patients and so forth. Um, we're gonna take patients who are non-responders and put them in the machine and study them in three settings. CRT off, their current setting and their best setting. 
we'll do the map first and figure out what their best setting is. And uh, then they'll get randomized. So this is a pilot study that the foundation is funding and we're hoping to get a larger study after we get some preliminary data. So I'll finish with, with the future. So my vision is that um, this, uh, this electrical desynchrony mapping can be um, combined with programmers. So a device rep comes in with a programmer, they put it on, we run through automatically a whole series of settings and we tell them which settings to check because we know based on the patient's QRS, PR, et cetera, which settings to check. And then it just runs through all the settings automatically and spits out a map and you program the patient and they walk out. Um, that's what I think the future is and I think we're gonna be doing that in, in everybody after they get a device in and also in patients who are like rehospitalized and not responding or maybe, maybe yearly because things change, they have an infarct, something changes in their conduction system. So the advantage of this is it's cost effective, there's no disposable supplies, equipment's not expensive, we can do it with an EKG machine, it's automated, there's no observer bias. Um, it's time efficient, we can generate one of these in 40 minutes. It's non-invasive, you don't have to use dye, you don't have to use contrast, no imaging needed, it's reproducible, it's physiologic, it works every time, um, and it's physician independent. The physician doesn't even need to be there, all they need to do is look at the map and make a decision afterwards. Um, so I think this is gonna impact you know, all three of the bubbles that I, that I showed you. Um, it's gonna help us in particular with optimizing devices, determining what AV and VV delay you want, whether to sense or pace from the atrium, whether you use BIV or LV only programming, which of the quadrupolar electrodes to use, whether the patient is, needs a new lead, and whether you need to try LBB area pacing or to program that. It can help you, eventually we're working on some, on some new patents to figure out how to have uh, an EP in the lab actually tell you when they put a lead in a certain position exactly whether it's the right position or not. We're working on that right now. And then patient selection, I think it's gonna lead to an increase in the patients that are getting this and the type of patients that are getting this. Um, so what's the value? Well, to patients, the value is, I think, uh, pretty, pretty clear, but I tried to quantitate some. So if you decrease the non-responder rate by 10%, this, this is data um, from uh, Varma at Cleveland Clinic on uh, non-responders versus responders. Um, you'll, call, you'll have 3,500 less hospitalizations per year, 543 less deaths. If you can even make a 10% drop, in a non-responder rate. I think we can do way better than that. Costs, if you take a 10% drop in the non-responder rate as far as cost, you'll save $62 million annually. Um, and for, for companies, if you increase their market share or grow their market by 10% more than projected, it's gonna be about $4 billion in revenue over the next 10 years. So pretty much everybody should win from this technology. Uh, and here's our last slide, or vision of the future. You know, we, we have a research and licensing agreements with Medtronic to work on this. Uh, I uh, wanna talk with Scott uh, and MHIF about developing a science uh, center of excellence. Uh, we're starting, we'll, we've started a trial, but we wanna move this to other sites, a multi-center randomized trial early next year. Uh, we wanna develop some centers of excellence so that all patients get optimized in the, in the Alina system. We're working on patents for lead location and we need to start educating people. And hopefully by 2024, 2025, we'll have this commercialized. Um, that's the end, thank you. That was fantastic. Um, I have so many questions, I don't know what to <laughs> Sorry I didn't leave you a lot of time. Okay, no. so, so you mentioned that this can help you determine whether LV only pacing versus by you know uh, mm -hmm. by pacing is better. In general, if, if everything is equal, do you see value of an additional value for LV only pacing? So that's one question. The second is, you know, we've always looked at the echo at the mitral inflow to see if you know we don't want to truncate the A wave and so right. forth. So if you use this, can you say, well, a longer AV delay, as long as you can achieve that along the red line is, is better? Do you even need echo to look at that? And yeah. finally, in patients with complete heart lock, so you don't have a native, and it's by the pacing, not an ICD, so APEX is not an issue. Do you see a value of putting a septal location with an LV, um, or or doesn't matter? So with, uh, I'll start with the last one with complete heart block. Um, 
I think getting the RV and LV leads in good positions is really important because you don't have that native wayfront. So having a, 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 like an LVB area pacing or a SEPTA lead in a good location is really important. And, it's getting, right? and an LV, either, either by itself, yeah. either by itself, if you've got really good electrical system, conduction or by the, but either way, you want that RV lead, you don't want it sitting down at the apex, I think you want it in a better position to try and make use of the intrinsic conduction system. So um, the, uh, the first question was L, LV only pacing versus by the, LV only pacing is better than by pacing in most patients. And the reason is because the native wavefront is much better at fusing with the LV paced wavefront than, than the RV wavefront because oftentimes your RV lead is, it's not even always on the septum. Sometimes it's on the lateral wall of the heart. You, we don't even know. You put them in there, you can't even hardly tell where it is at when you look at, unless you do a CT scan and look really carefully, you don't even know where the LV lead, RV lead is. And it's much better to fuse from the base than from the apex because the widest part of the heart is the base. Number one, number two, the conduction velocity longitudinally, so from apex to base, is four times as fast as the conduction velocity circumferentially going around the heart. So what determines how these wavefronts fuse is whether you can have these wavefronts fusing in a circumferential direction at the widest part of the heart, which is the base. So, uh, and when we look at electrograms, if you get LV only pacing and you program it right, they look better than with bivy pace it doesn't mean bivy pacing isn't isn't okay. It's just LV only pacing is better in most patients. And I showed you a lot of those. Um, uh, if if you do bivy pacing, you got to get the VV delay right. You got to get the LV lead ahead of you know ahead enough to fuse right. So, uh, and then the, the middle question was uh, the AV delay is the longer oh, AV yeah. delay along that. You don't really need an echo for that. When when we get these patients programmed. Um, there's like a wide range of AV delays where you still get good mitral inflow. So it's within most of the reasonable range you use. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. If you get the electrical synchrony right, the, the mitral inflow will, look, will be fine. Just avoid a very short AV delay probably along that range. No, but in some patients, they really need a really short one. And the reason is because let's say they're L, like that one I showed you where there's latency, the 80 milliseconds latency. Your LV lead is firing but it's not actually depolarizing the heart until 80 milliseconds later. So you may need a really, really short AV delay in that patient, but it's not gonna screw up your mitral inflow because uh, the electrical activity is, is dyssynchronous. The heart is being depolarized at a different time than when the, the LV lead is firing. So in some patients, you need really short AV. We've had some programs, some patients that 40 milliseconds or 60 milliseconds AV delay, and in the right patient, it's fine. It's not a problem. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Brink. Fascinating, and I have a million questions also, but one, one burning issue that, that is, is problematic is when we have patients with LV dysfunction, especially AFib who've got an AV node ablation or, or, um, or complete heart block. And we have to put an ICD lead and we're trying to position the coil where it can defibrillate, and we always end up with an RV lead in the apex. Right. Uh, that's our pace sense location. Right. To get a good left ventricular location anatomically, right. but we don't get a response from CRT. Right. Do you, uh, do you envision ad ever adding a, 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 a septal left bundle pacing lead to optimize pacing yeah. and preserve the ability to defibrillate. Yeah, I think you're paying a price by having to get the defibrillator lead down in the apex. You're paying a price at resynchronization. And so maybe it would make sense to have a, a good, you know, basal LV septal lead. And if you can get it in the left bundle branch uh, area, that'd be great. But even if you can't, it probably in a better position, you're probably gonna pace them better. Now in patients that have in those patients that have native conduction, you're okay because then you just program them LV only and you fuse a native wavefront with, with your LV lead, which is in a good spot. Well, I'm a little uh, presentation, uh, Alan, and, and really enjoy the, you know, having the chance to work with you. I have a couple of questions here. One is, um, you know, your thoughts on the response of CRT seen through the lens of mitral regurgitation improvement. You know, there's some work that is almost a flip of a coin. We go with the, the synchronous 
white PRS, but not every patient responds. You know, can this optimization improve that response rate? And the second is, you know, can also this uh, CRI that you described here help us out understand, you know, which patients with RBBB, you know, because RBBB is another complex right. topic, why they don't do so well? Right. So, um, so for the RBBB patients, I didn't talk about them because I didn't, didn't have time. That's a whole different yeah. kettle of fish. But what we found in, and we're still trying to figure out RBBB, but some RBB patients do respond to CRT. I have some good examples of patients. They don't respond as well on average, uh, near as well as LBBB patients. What we found is that for RBBB patients, what you need to do is just assume they're like a complete heart block patient or an AFib patient. Just forget about the native wavefront and just fuse the RV paste and LV paste wavefronts. So if you program them in a short AV delay, and that, so I, I have examples of patients that have gotten a lot better with RBBB where I, where I paste the LV wavefront 40 or 60 milliseconds ahead of the RV wavefront. Now, if you tell that to most electrophysiologists, say you're you're an idiot. Why are you why are you programming the LV lead ahead of the RV lead when the problem is a right bundle branch block? But what's what you're doing is you're saying I don't care about the native wavefront. I'm just going to pretend I'm fusing the two ventricular leads, and then I'm going to figure out how to get the timing right for those two. And if you do that, some of the RBB patients will get better. Now, some of them. A lot of them don't, or some of them don't, because maybe dyssynchrony isn't their main problem. It's something else. But if, if they, you know, if they have a QRS of 150, 160, and they have an RBB, and, and their, their heart looks dyssynchronous, then oftentimes you can, you can improve that. And then uh, as far as the mitral regurgitation, uh, if you get the dyssynchrony better, you're going to improve the mitral regurgitation in most of these patients. Because the, we know the mechanism of the MR is, is the... Um, you know, relates to the papillary muscles and how, how they contract and um, making the, the um, mitral annulus narrower and all things like that. So, um, so if, if you improve the dyssynchrony, you'll make the mitral regurgitation better in a lot of, in a lot of patients. Yeah. Scott? Do you have any data to show that if you resynchronize at rest that you are resynchronizing at higher heart rates as well? Yeah, we haven't done studies at, at higher heart rates, but my thoughts on that are that, you know, with the ventricle remodels, it, it, it's not, well, so, okay, so what percentage of time are you, are really active? So in our patients, you know, if you look at their, <laughs> you look at their activity histograms and stuff, on, you know, maybe what, 5% of the day or something or a couple, you know, whatever, a small percentage of the day they're active. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the ventricle to remodel, to get it to squeeze better, get it to be smaller. And so I think people make way too big a deal about, you know, what's going on at, when their heart rate's faster and when they're doing activity. Now, yeah, if you're a, if you're a um, 400 meter dash Olympian, yeah, you better have that pretty damn perfect with activity, the timing. But if you're just walking around during the day and you're doing it, and most of the time you're, you're sitting and, uh, and not doing that activity, um, and you're not a, a, an athlete or something, I don't think it's going to matter very much. And I think what you want is you want to get the timing correct while they're 90% of the day so that they remodel and, and uh, their heart improves. So, Yes? I have one online question from Dr. Hauser. It's kind of a three-parter, but it is, uh, how can we optimize every CRT patient? I know you briefly touched on that. Um, uh, the follow-up questions are, how often should it be done, and could any of this process be automated? Yeah, so um, I, think, I think, you know, we can do it to, to every patient as, as this gets automated. And the way of automating it is um, to, uh, so we can generate a grid of all, all the possible combinations for any vector. And then we, because these patterns are so consistent, we, we don't need to measure all, like I showed you, 80, 8 times 8, 64 different combinations in this grid. We might only need to do 20 or 25 of them to get, be able to generate a complete map. And um, so if we, if we figure out in each patient which settings we need to check, and then we have them automatic, and if we link it to a programmer, then we can do the whole thing in, in like 30 or 40 minutes. 
And, and so now, it, and it doesn't need a physician there. So it's, it's practical, it's doable, it's cheap, it's non-invasive. And um, you know, how often, uh, I think, after implant, everybody should be optimized. And I think any, and then on follow-up, maybe yearly or something like that. And then also if patients are not doing well, if they decompensate, if they have a major change in their clinical status, if they're hospitalized, those are the patients to look for. It's gonna be, this is gonna be like an EKG. We can do, you can do an EKG, it's just an EKG at a bunch of different settings, that's all it is. One, I mean, the question that Dr. Hauser asked is how can you benefit a lot of patients who don't have access to this? Would you say that, um, you know, if you look at the TRS in V1 at the time of the implant and maybe target around 40 millisecond first, I think we talked about that, that maybe you'll start from a much better place, like 40 millisecond and yeah. an RS in, in, in V1 yeah. and just start there and LV only pacing. Yeah, if you, you start there, you'll do better. But then you'll take away some of my business, so. <laughs> I was wondering if I should ask the question. So, <laughs> so yeah, if I, said if, if I said you didn't have any of this and you just had to guess, I would say I'd look at V1, I'd try and get a lead in a poster lateral location, and I'd, and I'd give them like 40 milliseconds of LV preactivation. That's what I do. And, and, and I would try and, um, and, but I would, actually I would program LV, LV only, only pacing. Only. If I had to do by V because of a heart block or AFib or whatever, then, or even paroxysmal AFib, if I had to, wanted to do by V, then, uh, yeah, then I'd just give them 40 milliseconds of LV preactivation. But, and you know, and that'll work for a higher percentage of patients than are currently getting it as standard settings, but it's still so individualized that you, you need to do something like this for each patient. Thank you.